Good morning, participants. Welcome to the webinar hosted by the PG Department of English in association with IQAC MSS College, Pandalam. To start the proceedings formally, let me call upon our head of the department, Dr. J. Anjana, to welcome the resource person and other uh, participants. Welcome, Anjana, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. The Department of English and Mrs. College Pandalam, in association with the IQAC of the college, is organizing a webinar series titled Literature in the New World. Today, we are having the second talk in this webinar series titled Politics uh, of Language in the Post-Colonial Literature. Today, we are having a, a erudite scholar and a brilliant academician as a resource person, Dr. Samuel Rufus. He's the Associate Professor at uh, Madras Christian College, Chennai. He's a, a well-known figure in the literary academia. Uh, he has been uh, the resource persons in, person in various national and international seminars as well as webinars. We are extremely happy and delighted to have you here, sir, this morning. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of uh, the department, as well as the IQAC, I deem it my great honor to extend our a wholehearted welcome to this session. I also welcome Dr. Jay Gumar, the convener of uh, the IQAC of our college, and each and every participant across India and abroad to this session. Please keep your uh, audio and video muted so that we have a very seamless and hassle-free session ahead. Thank you for joining us, and now it's over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anjana, for having invited me for this uh, wonderful webinar series and to Professor Ranjit and the entire faculty team at NSS College Pandalam for having invited me. And I'll straight away go to the topic. And before that, let me uh, ask you if you have your pen and a little notebook ready. In case you come across anything new, you could always make a note of it. And maybe later you could uh, clarify it towards the end of the session. So now uh, let us begin. The topic is the politics of language with reference to post-colonial literature or the politics of language in post-colonial literature. I'll start with a basic definition, a very common definition of power. Uh, the word power we all know means the ability to exert influence or control over others. Isn't it right? This is a broad definition of power. There are two types of power as we all know, broad types of power is one is we call it right physical power the second one as we know it is rhetorical power or the power of language so physical power right you can't exert physical power over a lot of people at the same time maybe you know brawn power you call it you can't exercise it at the same time it's difficult right? at the same time Using your rhetorical power, rhetorical power means the power of words, you can exercise power over large sections of society and make them come to your point of view or subscribe to your point of view. And that's the power of right rhetoric. The definition of rhetoric is, we all know, right, uh, the ability to convince or persuade people, as simple as that. Right? Rhetoric means the ability to convince or to persuade people. So here, uh, rhetorical power, how does rhetorical power operate in society and what are its implications for post-colonial studies? I will start with the 1987 book that's by David Crystal. We all know this very famous encyclopedia of language. See, there are two uh, books on, uh, you know, by, written by David Crystal. One is the Encyclopedia of Language and the other is the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English Language. Both are phenomenal books, right? He's one of the greatest uh, linguists of the present century. Uh, he had come over, you know, 10 years back to the British Council of Chennai. We also had the chance to meet up with him. So he, in his 1987 book, right, The Encyclopedia of Language, says that language has seven functions, right? All functions, you know, categorically are summed up into seven, seven functions of language. You should please read this wonderful book. The first function he says, the power of sound. The second function he calls recording of facts. The third function he calls expression of emotion, right, or emotional expressions. The fourth function he calls control of reality. 
I repeat, control of reality. This is important for us. That's why I'm, I'm talking about the fourth point, right? In special. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, how uh, it becomes an instrument of thought or a social interaction. And the last one is expression of one's identity that George Bernard Shaw says in his um, a big malleon, right? I can fix a person within one mile's radius in London, sometimes even to a street. So I'm going to the fourth point, control of reality. How does language control reality? And what are its implications for post-colonial studies? And with reference to a few sources, visual, oral, and print, I would like to exemplify on this aspect, on language vis-a-vis -vis reality. For Ferdin, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, we all know, one of the greatest philosophers of the past century, he says, if you want to access reality, if you want to have full control of reality, the real real, he calls it, you should go beyond the realm of language and culture. Because he says the language is a trap. I repeat, he calls it the trap of language. You have to break free from the trap of language if you have to access the real reality. This is uh, Nietzsche. After that, uh, Cezure, uh, one of the you know, founder of modern linguistics, we can call him, right? He says, right, language becomes a mediator for accessing reality, right? Sign becomes a mediator. Sign, we know, is made of the signifier and the signified. It helps us uh, access reality. So that there is no direct relationship between the sign and reality says Sazur. That means it is arbitrary. No, we all know it. And then uh, I'll just take you to a 1946 essay written by George Orwell. It's titled Politics and the English Language. In this essay, he talks about the politics behind the English language. He calls it, you know, double speak. Double speak means he hates metaphors because metaphors polish reality like Nisha also says no, in the previous century, he says, you know, what is truth but a mobile army of metaphors and metonymies. He doesn't believe in one truth per se. The truth structures given to us by language, according to Nisha, according to right, um, the post-structuralist theorists, is oppressive. And that's what Orwell says, excuse me, in his, uh, in his essay. And three years later, in the year 1949, again, he talks about, right, uh, in his uh, wonderful dystopian novel, titled 1984, he talks about how Newspeak becomes the official controlled language of Oceania and how it controls thought processes, the identity, and uh, the expression, the self-expression of the people of Oceania. And I'll just take you to the, uh, a book written by Catherine Belsey in the year 1999. It's titled Culture and the Real. It's a very important book. Excuse me. It's a wonderful book uh, that I love a lot. I love Catherine Belsey a lot. She has written a lot of books, like David Crystal again. I've written a lot of books. And this book in particular interests me because she says, till the 19th, it's titled Culture and the Real. Again, you know, she's a, a devotee of, uh, of uh, Lacan. Lacan says, no, right? You don't have access to the real, real, right? A child has access to the real, the real only through the symbolic order. In a psychoanalytic theory, he says this, right? So only through the symbolic order, the child gains access to real, but reality is beyond the symbolic, he says. And uh, the same applies, you know, to Catherine Belsey, who is a devotee of Lacan. Uh, Catherine Belsey says in her uh, book, Culture and the Real, till the 19th century, we were under the assumption that culture was synonymous with the real. I repeat, we were under the assumption that culture was synonymous with the real. <coughs> but uh, in the 20th century, a whole lot of schools of social theory, the Frankfurt School, and a whole lot of other schools of social theories, made us believe that culture 
is not synonymous with real rather culture dictates the real or culture produces the real shocking isn't it culture produces the real and culture we all know the dominant culture raymond williams calls it no dominant culture emergent culture residual culture right the dominant culture of a particular society always controls everything as regards you know uh, knowledge and you know other things of society so this dominant culture always has access to power so power indirectly controls society or reality and this is what exactly you know post structuralist theories tell us how our reality is controlled or conditioned by culture tiongo says language carries culture or in other words how reality is conditioned by language 20th century theories have given a lot of importance to the uh, the, the importance of uh, language in conditioning our reality or perspectives or perceptions uh, Catherine Belsey tells us, you know, how we are impacted by this conditioning, advertisements that come up in the media, how they condition reality for us, how they give us culture or produce culture. Culture is something that is produced by the so-called capitalists or whoever is in power in society. Now, uh, this is what Foucault also says in his uh, 1969 book, Archaeology of Knowledge, right? We all know that that language is oppressive after the 1960s itself we find a renewed emphasis on the importance of language to societal structures so language conditions reality and this language is oppressive in that right the dominant culture whatever attribute it gives to language it stays if it likes the heteronormative the heteronormative stays right the others those who are outside these binaries, these normatives, are given a pejorative label. You know what is a pejorative label? A pejorative means the same word, when it is applied alone in isolation, it becomes a negative word, pejorative label. For example, I say, he drinks coffee. It means, you know, he likes coffee, he drinks coffee. But when I cut off coffee and I say, he drinks, it becomes pejorative. The same word drinks, when it applied to coffee, it means something positive, but when it comes alone in isolation, it becomes negative or pejorative. So language gets a pejorative label when it comes to define or to denote or to represent the others. It could be others in the sense, others outside the normatives, the basic givens that Peter Barry tells us. Post-structuralist theories in general, post-colonial theory in particular, talks about this oppressive nature of language. In other words, it is not we who speak the language, rather it is language that speaks us. See the difference? Language conditions, controls, constructs our reality for us. Like Lacan says, or Misha says, or Zazur says, or Foucault says, so after you know the 1960s, the turn to theory gives added emphasis on the power of language. Postcolonial theory, in particular, focuses on how language is oppressive. Uh, 1952, a very phenomenal, polemical, right, controversial book, polemical book was written by Franz Fanon. I would call him, or you know, postcolonial. Studies scholars would call him the progenitor or the pioneer uh, in postcolonial studies. So, Ed, uh, Franz Fanon, right, he wrote his book titled Black Skin, White Masks. I repeat, Black Skin, White Masks, right? White Masks. So, in this wonderful book, he talks about how language becomes a tool of the colonizer to make the colonized internalize certain value systems as the normative. When he was in the train, he tells us of his experience, a humiliating, debilitating experience that he encountered when he was in the train, traveling in a compartment surrounded by white people. He was the lone black person in the compartment. And when you know, certain you know, white people started shouting at him and said, oh, black, you know, 
little child there was shouting at and saying, oh God, black, I, I, I hate black. So as if, you know, black was synonymous with the devil. Till then, you know, he was a psychiatrist. He was not interested in these you know, racial politics at all. But for the first time, he says, he felt that he was not a subject. He sees that he realizes, he feels for the first time ever in his life that he was an object at the mercy of somebody else. We know an object cannot determine its own identity. The identity of an object has to be given by somebody else, a subject. So for the first time, he feels that he is not a subject, but he's an object at the mercy of somebody else. And this objectification of the colonized is done through the power of language he feels and the power of the colonizer that makes him an ob object society. It makes him feel inferior. He says, internalizing the language of the empire, that is the English language, doesn't empower me, rather it disempowers me or makes me feel inferior. It gives me added trauma. This is very important to trauma studies also, right? Because, you know, the, 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 the power of language to inflict psychological wounds on a person. And these racial stereotypes that happen in the name of language, in the power of language. 1995 uh, memoir, Barack Obama's memoir. I always quote this because I love reading him again and again. Right? So he writes in his memoir that, you know, way back uh, when he was an ordinary guy, he was roaming around the streets of New York when there was a lady, a, a, a young girl, a white girl, who was talking to him. By default, spontaneously, she asks him, now see this racial stereotyping that happens. Do you play basketball? Right? A woman in the supermarket asked him, do you play basketball? Oh, I like Stevie Wonder. Do you like him? Obviously, there is a racial stereotyping that has happened there. The principal of a school, he recollects. He says, oh, you look cool. That means, you know, there is a stereotyping that happens. Basketball associated with the blacks, right? It could be Michael Jordan or anybody else. These racial stereotypings that happen because of the power vested in language. That's why Foucault says language is oppressive. Now, this, this strat strategies that, you know, post-colonial scholars adopt to come out of this oppressive power structure of language. In, um, after this uh, 1952 book, Black Skin, White Masks, right, you find a wonderful book in 1989 written by Gauri Vishwanathan. It's called The Masks of Conquest. I repeat, Masks of Conquest. In the sense, right, the English, the colonizers, conquered us through a mask. The mask was, right, obviously, language, the power of language. They made us feel inferior because we were lacking in culture, we were lacking in values, we were lacking in civility, and we had to internalize another language, the language of the power, powers that be, in order to be called civilized, right? This was the agenda. She quotes from um, uh, Macaulay's, Thomas Babington Macaulay's uh, 1835 famous uh, minute, right? Uh, we all know the 2nd February, 1835, an unforgettable day for English education in India. And she quotes from that, she says, right, uh, what was the objective or the modus operandi of English education in India? Uh, uh, Macaulay says this, right? A class of people, Indian in blood and color, but English in the tastes and opinions. I repeat, a class of people, Indian in blood and color, but English in the taste and in their opinions. And we also know the famous or infamous statement that he made about a single cell shelf of an European library putting to shame a whole, right, the, the literatures of India and Arabia put together. So this, this stereotype of how the East is lacking in culture and they need to be civilized by giving them the language is something that post-colonial studies scholars interrogate. And uh, in 1989, right, a very famous book was published, again, apart from Masks of Conquest, it's titled The Empire Writes Back, 
Bill Ashcroft, we all know, right? A post-colonial studies scholar. He, along with two others, right, Helen Tiffins and Gareth Griffiths, they both, they, they three together came up with a wonderful book. Now, what is the solution? What are the strategies to be adopted by post-colonial studies scholars in order to uh, stay clear of this oppressive power structure? Thiongo, Gugi Wa Thiongo, he was in uh, Delhi a few years back. Some of us had the privilege of meeting up with him also, a very old octogenarian, but still, right? The spirit within him is indefic indefatigable. He was here and in his, in his wonderful essay on decolonizing the mind, Thiongo says, it is not necessarily important that we are decolonized economically. We are decolonized, you know, physically or geographically, but more important is to decolonize our mind from the structures or the corridors of power that have stereotyped us in the realm of language. Decolonizing the mind. He talks about a specific aspect in his society, in Kenyan society, where he feels that, you know, the people there in a society, if they don't talk in English, they are looked down upon. They are reviled. They are mocked at. And this aspect made him feel very bad. So for the first time he says, I will stop writing in the tongue of the oppressor because I feel language learning was a cerebral experience, was just a cerebral experience for my children or for our children in our African society. It was not an emotionally felt experience, he says. It was not an emotionally felt experience. So from then on, he stopped writing in English and he embraced Gikuyu, his native tongue. From then on, he starts writing in that, right, in his native tongue. Chinua Achubi, on the other hand, begs to differ. He says, I appreciate you know, Tiango for it, but still, he says, I would write in English, but I would use strategies. Disman dismantling the master's own house, using the master's own tools. These are strategies. Post-colonial studies scholars, they don't neglect English because they know that almost the whole world has been colonized by English. And so they know that they cannot renounce English, but rather they could use English for their own means using their own strategies. And what are these strategies that post-colonial studies scholars have adopted or they adopt? Some of the strategies, you know, with, with specific reference to a, a few scholars, we will see. First of all, before we go in, I'll just give you a 2012, if I'm right, right? That movie, famous movie, English to English came up, where you find uh, Shri Devi, actor Shri Devi, she, you know, uh, she doesn't know her English and she's mocked at by her own family, her husband and her two children. And she feels very, you know, down and depressed. Because, you know, when she, when she goes to the school for the open house, there also her daughter mocks her because, you know, she feels bad because the mother is not able to talk in English. Then she has a chance to go to Manhattan in New York. And there she gets to learn the language. And when she learns English, and that she, she does very furtively, surreptitiously, secretly, she goes all by herself, catches a bus, goes to the place, New York Learning Center, the language learning center, and she learns the language there. And the moment she learns her first word, entrepreneur, her facilitator gives her this word. She walks down the street and you know, you must have seen the particular scene, right? Everyone, and it's a busy, you know, uh, busy peak time traffic there. She was walking down the road. Suddenly she exults. She's almost, she's like dancing. When she knows that she can pronounce one word in English, properly entrepreneur this is the internalizing that post-colonial studies questions it is not attacking the english language per se it is you know the stereotypes that come along that make you feel inferior all along if you had seen in the, in the movie she would not have a smile on her face at all she'll always be sad solemn but once she gets to learn one word, she feels happy. After that, you'll see most of the time she's happy because she has learned 
the English language, the language of empowerment. We know this obsession with English that has caught on almost in all these post-colonial nation states. Not bad. Chinuachibi also says it's not bad. South Korea, we know. I, I, I remember having read an article uh, way back in 2004 where it says the young children were forced into English medium schools and the tip of the tongues, they did an operation on the tongue because, you know, they can speak English better. South, uh, South Korea. Shocking. In India, also a host of English medium schools that want to imbibe, not bad. We even we do literature, right? It's like self-interrogation, self-criticism. Yes. But the moment it makes us feel inferior, that is where right, post-colonial studies is, in, is up in arms. Of course, we had Commonwealth literature, the Trinity of Commonwealth, um, Mulkra, Janand, Rajarao, and R.K. Narayan. They had their own strategies. Rajarao gave us a Sanskritized in, uh, English, right? Uh, the R.K. Narayan wrote with a typical Indian idiom. Almost all his works, novels, right? You'll find the typical local idiom. He tries to universalize the local in his own sweet ways. Yes, but I would say the transition from Commonwealth literature to post-colonial, personally, I would say, starts in the year 1965 when Kamala Das wrote Summer in Calcutta, a collection of her poems, right? And in this particular poem titled An Introduction, she says, right, why not, please, why not, my dear cousins, and I'm just paraphrasing, why not you just allow me to talk and write in the language that I like? I am Indian, dark brown. I am Indian, dark brown. I am from Malabar. I, you know, I speak two languages and uh, I dream in one. And then she gives a famous phrase. The language that I speak becomes mine. That means it could be any language. <laughs> when I speak a language, it becomes mine. I internalize it. It could be half English, half Indian whatever it may be, but it is mine. I celebrate it. It comes to me as naturally as cawing comes to a crow or roaring comes to a lion. So please allow me to celebrate my language. She was phenomenal. 1965 you know, when she wrote this. The language that I speak becomes mine. This is a strategy. That this, this is where the transition comes in. Right? Much before you know, even Derrida, right, who had come out with his famous essay or lecture in the year 1966, Structure, Sign and Play. So, Kamala Das gives us a unique voice of protest where she says, allow me to speak or write in the way that I like. I'm not, you know, I'm not succumbing to any value system. I celebrate my own voice. <clears throat> Walt Whitman, 1892. If I'm right, song of myself. The very first song says, I celebrate myself. I celebrate. This is a strategy in post colonial studies celebration of oneself, one's identity, one's voice. And he says, you know, in song 52, if I'm right, song 52, he says, I sing my barbaric yop. Barbaric. My voice, it might be barbaric. Yop means horse course upon the roofs of the world. That means, right, although it might sound barbaric to you, it is my voice. I would speak my voice. I will not allow, like Gayatri Skyvak says, right, there is a difference between representation and representation. You can't represent me. You can rather represent me from your own idiom. But representing, you can't do that. I have to speak for myself. That is why in his uh, famous interview in 1994 to the Paris Review, you know, Chinua actually rarely gives interviews, but Derek Walcott goes around going a lot, giving a lot of interviews. Chinua in this 1994 interview to the Paris uh, Review, right, he says about this, you know, the concept of lion that Kamala Das talks about, you know, it comes to me as the roaring of a lion, she says. See the roar of a lion. He says, until, I just quote uh, be here, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify 
only the hunter. I repeat, until the lions have their own historians. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So he compares himself or you know their society to lions. And lions have a voice. It is so peculiar. Like Kamalada says, it's a roar. And this voice is unique to them. They need not go by any other voices. They did not imbibe any other voice because they have a unique voice, roar. Edward Kamau Brathwaite almost replicates the same when he says, he says, you know, the hurricane doesn't roar in pentameter. It's a very, you know, one statement that I so loved in all of post-colonial literature is Edward Kamau Brathwaite's, you know, it is from history of the voice. This is a wonderful line. He says, the hurricane doesn't roar in pentameters. That means the pentameter has been the, the, the familiar mode of expression for English literature. All of English poetry, you find the pentameter, the iambic pentameter. But Edward Kamau Brathwaite says, good, the pentameter has its own experience, but it can never replicate or even come near the experience of the hurricane. Why is that? Because the hurricane has the power to even destroy you. The hurricane has so much enormous power within it, like the roar of a lion that Kamala Das talks about, the voice of a lion that Tinua Achbi talks about. Edward Kamau Brathwaite talks about, he, you know, he was the first one to come out with a concept called nation language, right? Nation language is something unique. He says, right, uh, I write in a language that car carries my cultural experience. I write in a language that carries the burden of my cultural experience. This is Edward Kamau Brathwaite, the concept of nation language. The next one is from the oral. First, I told you an example from the visual, English to English. The second one is the oral. Oral, in the sense, uh, a song that most of us are familiar. That's why I took a very you know, a familiar song. Uh, it's titled, you know, Brown Girl in the Ring. It's a very famous song uh, back in the 1970s. To be sure, it is 1977 or 1978. The song was very popular in those days. And uh, it, it tells about the celebration of the brownness of a brown girl. And see, we should remember one thing here. We can't expect a Donald Trump to come and celebrate my identity. You can't expect, you know, somebody from Britain to come and celebrate your identity. You can't expect a person from Australia to come and celebrate your identity. You have a voice, a peculiar voice. Voice. It is the roar of a lion or the power of a hurricane. And it's up to you to celebrate your voice. And so here, the brown girl is celebrated in her color, see, in the previous poem in uh, an introduction by Kamala Das, we saw, I'm dark brown. She celebrates it. Color doesn't remain an obstacle for me to celebrate myself. Maya Angelou says, no, phenomenal woman. Celebration of myself. Walt Whitman says, I celebrate myself. And this celebration of herself in Brown Girl in the Ring, where, you know, she's in a ring, and she's brown. If you see that uh, song, the lyrics of the song, they're so motivating. Right? She looks like a sugar in the plum. Show me your motion. Tra -la 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 -la. Just show me your motion. Motion means, right, the sway of my hips that Maya Angelou tells us. I am phenomenal because of the sway of my hips, right? The way I walk is phenomenal. The way I you know, move about is phenomenal. That's why he says, show me your motion. Tra -la 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 -la. The way you walk, the way you talk, tell me that because you are phenomenal. And the beautiful line there comes is, she looks like a sugar in the plum. That means she has her own sweetness within her. She doesn't have to rely on, on sweetness from somebody else. She has her own charm. She has her own aura, what in his 1935 essay, Walter Benjamin would call the aura 
aura is essentially unique to a person or to a particular object or a particular thing that cannot be replicated or duplicated. It has its own uh, place, space in time. And this is the celebration that we find in brown girl in a ring. The ring there gives her her space. The ring that makes her speak out her safety. She speaks out from this space, this empowered space, what Virginia Woolf would call a room of one's own. Brown girl in the ring. See, most of these songs of emancipation, although they are you know, sung for merriment these days, in Jamaica, these songs were children's songs that told them that they were special. This came way back. But here, in some of the post-colonial nation states, I'm a bit sorry to say this, that we still wax eloquent when a child talks about Mary had the little lamb. Who's Mary? What's the lamb? And what is the ikari dikari dock? The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one and the mouse ran down. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, my fair lady. The adjective, my fair lady. How these stereotypes reinforced Harold Bloom, you know, an advocate of the Western canon. Post-colonial studies scholars say, right, a stereotype gets created over a period of time by constant repetition of the negativity of someone or something over a period of time. Even a canon is created by coercive repetition. You repeat over a period of time and then it becomes canonical. You give a pejorative label to something over a period of time and it becomes a negative. So Brown Girl in the Ring is a song not only of resistance, but it is a song of celebration that extols the virtues of being brown. What Kamala Das says, I am dark, very brown. And these songs of resistance you find in Calypso, I'll just give you one song that you can maybe after you log out, you can please check into YouTube. You have this wonderful song, a very pertinent, intriguing song for post-colonial studies scholars or for anyone who does literature. Dan is the man in the van. Uh, an amazing song. Right? You'll be shocked. Right? Uh, one reason why post-colonial poetry or post-colonial you know, prose cannot be appreciated for its aesthetic viewpoint alone. Because most of post-colonial poetry carries a burden, carries an angst. It carries a burden with it. And this particular song, please look at the lyrics. I have played it many times in my classes uh, because you know, Dan is the man in the van, talks about how a colonial education was forced into the people the, in, the, the black people, and how it did not mean anything to them. It was just a cerebral activity. Mighty Sparrow, right? He was called the King of Calypso. Mighty Sparrow, he must be around 85 years now, if I'm right. Mighty Sparrow, uh, you know, he, he has come out with the lyrics of the song in Calypso, in the Calypsonian number, where he says, what is the use of you know, Rikki Tikki Tavi? Or Hickory Dickory Dock, the mouse ran up the clock. There are some cuss words, swag was also there. But remember, they are expressions of protest. So we should not take it from the literal point of view. We should look upon it as expressions of protest. Dan is the man in the van. He talks about how the colonial education forced upon them an eighth grade student in school, a black girl child in school. She is appreciated not for her intelligence, not for her uh, abilities. In the eighth grade, they are taught what is called the, these poems. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse. The one who pronounces it well, enunciates it well, comes out with the poem well, they are given thunderous applause, a standing ovation. That means you have an English that you should look up to. You have a language, the, it, it could be the language of the oppressor, but a language that gives you your identity. 
David Abedin in his little, very short poem called Two Cultures talks about this. He says, you know, when a, when a boy talks BBC English, he's respected. When a person you know, in Guyana, where he is from, talks BBC English, they're respected. Oh God, he talks BBC, she talks BBC. You can't read one line or one word of the poem, I bet. Right? Because it's, it's difficult. It is in Creole, Guyanese Creole. But still, you should read the poem for the protest that it comes out with. Valerie Bloom, another writer. How David uh, Dabidine comes out with this protest towards the end, oh, there are a lot of swear words. You think upon me as a woman or, you know, I will give you a retort, he says. Michael Dayanang, Africa Speaks. You call me duck, I will raise the regal pyramids. These voices of protest. How they liberate A.K. Marotra, a wonderful right, poet in India, he says, the borrowed tongue sets the truth, the, the, my tongue free. Right? A borrowed tongue sets mine free. It is a borrowed, but when it comes with my voice, it makes me liberated. That is why in Dreams from My Father, Barack Obama says, I felt a person without identity when I was touring uh, Europe. When I was seeing everything, I felt an emptiness within me. Why was that? Everyone felt a subject. Well, I felt objectified. Why was that? Then he says, maybe that's because I'm just quoting him. My history is incomplete. My history is incomplete. I don't know anything about my history. And so, right, uh, he says, I have to go back to Kenya, I guess. There, I will know the truth, and the truth will make me free. The truth is knowledge about himself. Carl Jung says, no, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. This identity, self-identity, knowing who I am, my roots, without knowing my voice, my identity, my roots, if I am going to pronounce or I am going to extol the virtues of a Wordsworth or a Walter Scott or a Shakespeare, it becomes of no use to me because it becomes just a cerebral experience. It doesn't carry the burden of my cultural experience. Derek Walcott says, I met history once, but it doesn't seem to recognize me. The reason is, he wasn't given a voice. And even if they had a voice, like Gayatri Svivak says in a wonderful essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Their voice was not heard. Although they had a voice, their voice was not heard. I met history once, but he doesn't seem to recognize me. And there is a 2005 journal article, a journal article that uh, shaped, you know, uh, that shaped what is called uh, power structures in society. That's why we, we feel, you know, as practitioners of literature, every journal article that we write, every paper that we present is very important because it, it not only contributes something new to the already existing body of knowledge, but also transforms society for the better. So it is not just to get a certificate, we participate in a program or, you know, that's what I tell my students. What is that one point that you're telling society right, to impact or to change society for the better? Let's, let's make the world a better place. Right? It is called seeing white. Seeing white. If you just key in seeing white, you will have access to it. By the way, JSTOR, you know, JSTOR is giving access to um, its rich treasure trove of articles till 30th June because of the COVID pandemic, because we can't access libraries. They're giving it free of cost. I've been accessing it free of cost for the past one month. I'm just giving you a clue. You can just log in free, access JSTOR articles. 100 articles are free, right? So in this 2005 journal article, he says, how stereotypes about blacks have been perpetuated in Disney creations, Disney movies. 
and he also says how right there were no black princesses in any of the disney you know creations wait there is a rider you know i i've seen 1953 disney movie right that famous cartoon peter pan right 1953 movie no not in 1953 you know quite recently but it was in 1953 peter pan from right from then till date he says there have not been representations of people of color and he says when children look at these racial stereotypes of whiteness synonymous with gentleness meekness and forbearance and a whole lot of gracefulness when white you know well, princesses they don the mantle and they walk ele elegant and they you know walk the ramp he feels black children or children of color feel unsettled feel very odd when they look they feel unnerved they feel their identity is at stake they lose their self esteem he says so it unsettles them it destabilizes their ego and it was in the year 2005 and we all know how a voice of resistance that was in 2005 in 2009 you have disney coming up with its first black princess tiana right the the princess and the frog right the famous uh that movie that came up in 2009 after just four years and after that also you have you know sequels coming up but even in this 2009 this is a very comfortable movie a couple of years back when i was screening it for my you know as part of a cousins gathering i was screening it for the little ones the, the, for the children the nieces and the nephews one of my nieces promptly asked this question right when two girls were there tiana and you know charlotte was there charlotte is white and tiana is black i said the princess has come right wait watch watch the princess has come then she said spontaneously no but i thought charlotte was the princess i said no not not charlotte tiana this this black girl is a princess doesn't she look beautiful no she is not a princess the princess should be white snow white stereotypes that have come we have internalized where we are taught to look down on our own people sam selwyn in his 1979 lecture he says this how he himself as a little child internalized like right, this white supremacy in the language that he was taught 2009 you know there was what is called uh, the first time a representation and even after that although many people appreciated disney for coming up with the black princess for the first time but still there were scholars who said she is not quite black she is only you know, a bit black she should be completely black and you find the black princess there is so graceful so elegant and once you see this movie you start to empathize or to you know embrace the blackness of an individual it is the same our binaries are blurred so you know come in 1963 august 28th a very important day when martin luther gave his wonderful speech i like just one sentence from this speech he has a dream i have a dream that one day my four little black children will be judged not by the color of their skin but by the content of the character he had a dream 1899 when paul lawrence dunbar wrote sympathy he was giving a lament i know why the caged bird sings taken by maya angel leka it's a lament of misery in the 1960s it was a time of dreaming by the rivers of babylon davi sat down when we remember it it was a time of dreaming after that in the 1970s it was a time of resistance where you know uh, post colonial study scholars and people from post colonial nation states started resisting in their own literatures the internalizing power of the language of the colonizers in their own ways like kamala das's uh, poem and after that you know uh, an indian example i should quote as p sainath 
uh, you know, the Tower of Gabel. Please read this essay, Tower of Gabel, where he talks about right the hypocrisy in language, all the useless metaphors that we use. You know, George Orwell talks about it in his 1946 essay, you know, the politics and the English language. He says metaphors falsify reality. Please don't use metaphors. He says, especially with regard to you know uh, literal language. Don't use metaphors. So the same applies here. They, you know, they celebrated it in their own way. But after the resistance period, first it was a lament period, then it was a dreaming period, then it was resistance or protest literature, and now it is time for a celebration. Celebration of what? Celebration of my unique identity. Celebration of my voice. Like Walt Whitman says in his uh, uh, Song of Myself, I celebrate myself. Or uh, Kamala Das says, the language that I speak becomes mine. And this celebration tells us that they have a voice of their own. They will never be made to feel inferior or destabilized by somebody else because the blind are. call it it is no more history histories we call it a celebration of realities a celebration of Englishes how do we do that the Indian idiom is so unique we have a whole lot of words that are so unique to us that many of the Western countries won't have the cultural traditions that we have are so unique like uh, you know I, I've, I've all I've often repeated this concept of love marriage you ask a Westerner what is love marriage, they'll scratch their heads. They won't know what is love marriage. We have a concept of love marriage and arranged marriage. And we always use a lot of, you know, grammaticalizations, structural nativizations, glossings. Now, these are words I'm just quoting from uh, the Empire Writes Back. Right? This book gives us a lot of strategies. How, what are the strategies we can use? So discursive practices that Foucault tells us about. Edward Said gives us what is called, you know, contrapuntal reading. Richard Terryman gives us what is called a counter discourse, counter discursive apparatus, which helps us in subversive readings, subversive subtext. What is a subversive reading? A submerged layers of meaning hidden within a text. What Salman Rushdie would call chutnification. One glimpse into Midnight's children would tell us what chutnification is all about. It is a celebration. Rather than embracing the language of the colonizer per se, you celebrate your own identity because your language that you speak should reflect your own cultural experience. And that is what Salman Rushdie does. The latest crop of youngsters who are writing, Twinkle Khanna, I've always admired her for her books now. The, the, the latest crop of young Sanjeev Sanyal, Ashwin Sanghi, to name a few. They write in a, an idiom peculiar to India. Now, the, the common expression that we use right, in local parlance, coming, we never say, are you eating? We just say, eating, ah, coming, ah, right? going, ah, talking, ah, right? eating, ah, no. Okay, wow. okay, I know. Right? These are all what is called structural nativisms that Bill Ashcroft talks about in his Empire Rights Back. Strategies. In Things Fall Apart, you see that. Um, in his 1958 book, no, Things Fall Apart, we talk about um, you know, Obi. He doesn't say he went into a hut. He says Obi. Obi means in the glossing towards the end, they will call it, it's a hut. Or the Obong. So, you know, all these native words enrich and enhance or emancipate his identity because he feels the language that I speak should bear the burden of my cultural experience 
and how does it do that when i celebrate myself so going back to macaulay's minute where he says a, a, a class of people indian in blood and color but english in the taste and opinion now after this enlightenment we right in india or we in these post colonial nation states we start thinking about our own identity our own voice yes i am indian in blood indian in color but i don't want to be english in taste english in opinion because i have my own blood that is unique to me i have my own color that is unique to me i have my own taste that is unique to me i have my own opinions unique to me my likes my whims and my prejudices that are unique to me and i am going to celebrate them myself because my language that i speak has a voice that is so sweet the other day when i was critiquing the daffodils that is starting colleges and schools one professor one lady professor came up to me and said sir whatever you say about the daffodils right i feel the daffodils is a wonderful poem i said good ma'am i appreciate that i also love the daffodils even today i have a great fascination but how many of us here have ever seen a daffodil i haven't to be honest not most of us wouldn't have seen a daffodil why do i have to celebrate a daffodil that i haven't seen when there are a whole lot of beautiful flowers waiting to be celebrated in my own backyard this is the voice that i celebrate so today is the era of celebration when we don't acclimatize or imbibe the voice of the colonizer the oppressor's language but rather i celebrate myself my english is its own peculiarities that means i'm not going to reject english altogether but i'm going to speak in english that is uniquely mine maybe it is half indian of english english minglish whatever it is but it is mine and this gives me my voice and i know if i don't speak for myself nobody else can speak for myself and if i don't celebrate my voice no one else is going to celebrate my voice so this celebration of my voice my uniqueness therein lies my identity and a celebration of humanity thank you so much thank you professor so uh, let's celebrate ourselves a wonderful lecture given by you we have been reading the positive comments both on uh, zoom and uh, uh, youtube and uh, there are so many positive comments as well as questions so so i think uh, it's time for us to uh, look upon the questions i think there is one question which i came across sir yes. professor can you hear me yes 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 ma'am yes ma'am uh, see that is uh, one what makes a work post colonial the origin or the content of, of the work okay what makes uh, good, a work very... post colonial okay okay whether it is the origin I... author or the content yes 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 good good actually you know, any work could be read from a, applying post colonial theory any work like eco criticism could be applied even with uh, in a work that doesn't have trees or you know uh, greenery in it similarly any work could be dealt with in a post colonial way it could be you know colonial texts or you know post colonial texts any work not necessarily the author the origin or the content it could be any work right so in the beginning post colonialism is a primer i would say it is a primer it is by john mcloyd m c l e o d so this book tells us you know how um, you, you you can read a poco or a post colonial reading of text any text right? it could be you know whether you know there are implications of colonization there or you know without colonization why or why not so any text not necessarily a post colonial text that has its origin here no said another one that one participant wants to know about your views on the use of english in the study of nationalist representation 
nationalist representations yes, yeah. my, yes. my views of english my personal views right yes <laughs> i feel yeah thank you thank you ma'am i feel we need a unique idiom right not the idiom you know uh, ak ramanujan gave us a wonderful essay is there an indian way of thinking this would be a good starting point to you know uh, start off for this 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 questioner right is there an indian way of thinking is the wonderful essay where he says yes right there is an indian way of thinking and so it could be better represented only when we have a uniquely indian idiom that helps us better in understanding nationalistic text or rather it makes us you know uh, engaged partners in our readings of nationalistic texts right okay as uh, so another one in sites orientalism he speaks about eurocentric universalism what is your view on this that is yes. another one you, good 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 yes ma'am eurocentric universals are are wrong right because they are totalizations totalizations in the sense they are generalizations these universals like harold bloom says in his western canon right they tend to uh, negativize almost all the others the process of othering starts there when there is a universal so you know post structuralist theories they 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 don't want these totalizing narratives at all like in this 1978 book like etard says you know the post modern condition incredulity towards these totalizing narratives incredulity means a disbelief i don't believe in them because these universals cannot represent my condition feminism for example right uh, uh, buchi emuchita right she has written an essay called feminism with a small f she says i reject the feminism of the west because they don't you know they universalize feminism but i don't succumb to their views because you know it doesn't reflect my experience of being a woman so eurocentric universals are uh, are, are not necessarily right uh, a, a yardstick to judge any text for that matter or people for that matter sir another one um, what about the importance of appropriation of language from empire right backs in the post modern literature uh, may can, can you come again ma'am what is the importance of what is the importance of appropriation of language from okay empire right yeah. right back in the post modern literature good appropriation becomes a strategy like abrogation now uh, bill ashcroft talks about these uh, strategies this is this uh, concept is also given in another book uh, key concepts in post colonial studies appropriation is i take up the language of the colonizer i appropriate it and i use it to reflect my own experience It's like creole you can never never ever you know listen meaningful words in any creolized versions of this, these calypsos or reggaes the banana boat song right uh, for that matter you know any of these uh, uh, creolized versions you can't necessarily easily listen to them that is because of appropriation they appropriate it in order to bear the experience of their own culture and so you can't necessarily right so appropriation becomes a strategy it is a you know uh, it is a strategy there uh, sir another one uh, non british literature in english are almost all post colonial what necessitated to make a special branch of it so can have will will we ever have a post post colonial anti yes even the word post colonial is a very negative label right uh, previously we thought commonwealth literature was a demeaning label then we today we have what is called post colonial studies even the word post colonial personal there seems to be some problem sorry participants there seems to be some technical glitches in between kindly bear with us so uh, so can you hear me yes ma'am i think there is some problem with uh, the connection uh yeah there was some problem uh, i think uh, sir has gone uh, he's there so can you please unmute yourself
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's yes. yeah, it's working, sir. Yes. So please continue, sir. Okay. So the term postcolonial itself would become a misnomer in the future. So post postcolonial, yes, we call it you know neo colonization today, coco colonization today. But I feel you know this label will also soon disintegrate, and we'll have a better new label like we have new literatures today. Sir, so, uh, um, another one. What is the connection between diasporic writing and post-colonial writing? Uh, and now that uh, one, would you please talk something about black feminism? Oh, black feminism. Okay. Diasporic literature need not necessarily have the implications of the colonizer, but post-colonial writing looks upon this aspect. Diasporic writing has a different kind of a trauma. Post-colonial writing reflects another kind of a trauma. So although there is a trauma, there is an angst, but the way they express expresses is different. Black feminism, it is a whole beautiful area, and um, there are you know readers for black feminism. They don't want to use the word feminism at all. They rather go by the label uh, womanism. And you know, some some of the black feminists like Alice Walker and others, they don't want to be branded. In India. Also, most of the scholars who associate themselves with the nomenclature called feminism would not necessarily call themselves as feminists because they feel feminism doesn't cater or you know, is not inclusive towards their problems. Black feminism was born out of this need, the, the, the lacuna, the void, that feminism did not fill it up. And this totalizing, like uh, the previous question, right? These universals or these totalizing templates, how they, you know, made pejorative these black feminists. And so they have their own sorority, sisterhood, that celebrates them in their own unique ways uh, with womanism or another word is theonism. This is another word that, you know, black feminists use in particular. And uh, that is because, you know, uh, they feel white feminism has its own restrictions. In India also, we have a special brand of feminism called, uh, it's called, you know, third world feminism. Although the label might sound a bit, right, a, a misnomer, but still Chandra Talpadi Mohante, right, has written a beautiful essay. Anyone doing Indian feminism should necessarily read this article. It's a beautiful essay that she's written, Chandra Talpadi Mohante. It's called Under Western Eyes, right? It's an illuminating article. I cited it much. So black feminism is another wing that that, that that's a radical feminism that uh, you know dispels some of the you know theories laid down by western feminists sir uh, one question what is digital diaspora yes so this is a very pertinent relevant question digital diaspora in the sense like um, david crystal talks about you know orwell in 1946 talks about double speak 49, he talks about new speak. Then you have net speak today. David Crystal says you have net speak or text speak. Text speak in the sense we use text. So digital diaspora necessarily means, I just had a passing reference of that when I was reading on digital diaspora. When your agony and your angst, right, you put it down in the digital media. Because, you know, we know Derrida gave us a wonderful uh, text where he says, you know, the archives are filled with violence in the sense right in, the, in 10 years from now you won't have these uh, literal texts that we have these hard copies of text so you won't have archives of the you know uh, literal books that we have today so the future is all about the digital we have a separate genre for that today digital humanities so digital diaspora pours out their angst their you know uh, their, uh, their their uh, you know problems their agonies through the digital medium uh, and uh, there, there's a host, host of issues to be explored there. I'm just giving you an outline. Sir, uh, lots of questions are pouring in because of time constraint. Shall we wind up with one last question? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Has the discipline, culture studies, new historicism gained more value than post colonialism? Because post colonialism brings the colonial history to the forefront rather than the culture of the natives. In a way, holding on to this discipline is still keeping the colonizers visible in the discourses. Your take on that. Okay. Uh, can you repeat the last part? 
Uh, okay, um, because post-colonialism brings the colonial history to the forefront rather than the culture of the natives. In a way, holding on to this discipline is still keeping the colonizers visible in the discourses. Okay. Okay, the relevance of uh, you know culture studies or um, new historical uh, system of cultural history. materialism. Yeah. Right. Yes. You know, post-colonial studies per se looks upon texts basically with the history of colonialism, and you know, subtext, subtextual readings or subversive readings. You do that, but uh, new historicism or cultural materialism goes beyond that. It analyzes any text with an implication of power structures beneath it. Right. So the text history everything becomes you know integrated here the, it becomes a core text here and so you know new historicism literally you know, goes beyond the purview of post-colonialism post-colonial texts could also be read from a new historicist perspective okay sir now we shall uh, it was a wonderful session now we shall have uh, C. Prasad from our department to propose the vote of thanks Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, let me propose the official word of thanks for this wonderful session. First of all, I should uh, thank our management and our dear principal, Dr. R. Rajesh, for giving this opportunity to conduct this webinar. Uh, next, uh, we have to uh, thank our IQSC uh, convener, Dr. Jay Kumar for his constant support and uh, valid advice in order to conduct this uh, webinar on live. Uh, and uh, surely there is uh, immense help from the part of uh, Dr. Sharavanda Kumar sir from the physics department for his constant support. And uh, our resource person, I, I'm, I don't have any words to say because it was really a flow of words. And uh, always a good teacher teaches and uh, the best teacher always inspires her. and it was really a real journey through the words of uh, uh, the contemporary scenario especially we are living in a world of uh, uh, diversities uh, whether there is a need for celebration of diversities and uh, the topic you have selected and it is exemplary therefore we don't have any words to say for your uh, magnificent performance and it was a real uh, extempo and uh, the flow of words was really counting for us too and uh, we sincerely thank for your uh, wonderful participation in this seminar and uh, for your valid pieces of advice and uh, next i have to thank our hod the be all and end all of our department for giving this opportunity to conduct this session live and the convener of this uh, webinar dr uh, uh, Ranjit Krishnan sir and uh, Dr. J. Anjana and Dr. Ranjit Krishnan sir, we, they gave us the real background for conducting uh, webinars live and we, were, we are also in the, uh, what is it, the initial stages of conducting uh, sessions online and all the teachers in our department and uh, if there are no participants, uh, this won't be a nice endeavor. And I sincerely, uh, from the part of our department, we sincerely thank all the participants from our state throughout India and also participants from outside our land. And uh, with all your cooperation and support, we, we could have extended this live session uh, uh, to greater heights. And we hope that uh, your constant support will be there for our next webinar too. Last but not the least, uh, we sincerely thank the Almighty for giving us a nice atmosphere to conducting this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Prasad. Once again, a wholehearted thanks for being with us today. It was a wonderful session. We are looking forward to more academic interactions with you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.